to the Wibbly Wobbly Timey Wimey Podcast. I am Lucia Kelly, expert at applied analysis, and I'm the most stable person I know. Oh my God, the fact that the doctor said that unironically. <laughs> We're both hanging by a thread, Talia. Give us a moment. <laughs> And I'm Talia Franks, media critic, fanfic enthusiast, and scourge of scoundrels. Now that is accurate. <laughs> and we're here today for a wibbly wobbly mini song. The Vanquishers aired on December 5th, Far Future, 2021. It was written by Chris Chibnall and directed by Azur Salim. Reminder that time isn't a straight line. It can twist into any shape. And as such, this is a fully spoiled podcast. We might bring things in from later in the show, the comics, the books, the audio dramas, or even fan theories and articles. With that out of the way, we're all about disrupting the systems. So let's get in the TARDIS. IMDb says that in this Final epic chapter in the story of the Flux, all hope is lost. The forces of darkness are in control, but when the monsters have won, who can you count upon to save the universe? Our synopsis says that this is the one where the doctor gets real gay for herself and dad it... Oh my God. <laughs> and dad supremacy. <laughs> shut up (laughs) and dan is a bad wingman for yaz he's such a bad wingman for yaz bad wingman for yaz oh my god okay so let's just tell you this episode it's okay it was okay oh my god i will say (laughs) i will say that dan does have like awkward dad on the tardis energy right he's he's not a dad but he, feels- he could have been he could have been if they'd brought Peggy along by the way that storyline never got sorted we still have no idea what Peggy is doing Peggy is getting old in the early 1900s I'm just saying she's being raised by a vicar she could have been raised by Jericho Yaz and Dan I know the childhood I would prefer R.E.P. Professor Eustasis Jericho Scourge of Scoundrels. I hate to say that I saw it coming. I definitely also saw it coming. It was a really obvious sacrifice. Someone had to die and best to be the old white man, gotta say. (laughs) I think, okay, so full disclosure listeners, Talia and I have very different reactions to this episode. I loved it. I am feeling pretty neutral towards it. I've seen a lot of people on Twitter also feeling like this episode is mediocre or bad. Well, the main issue I have with it is not that it was bad. I think it was actually a really, really solid episode of Doctor Who. My problem with it is that it did not feel like a finale. Like, even with all of the, like scale I didn't feel like this actual like emotional anchor or stakes were there do you know what I mean it just felt like big set pieces especially that whole Sontaran Dalek Cyberman thing like they were there just to be there there was nothing actually done with it it was all this I want to feel like the universe is in danger and it never really did for me yeah I did think it was a little convenient that the way that the flux was solved was that the flux got absorbed by the passenger and then time made everything right again Right? Talk about a deus ex machina. My goodness. And everyone was saying the whole time, like, how are they going to resolve all of these threads in one episode? Turns out they're not going to. They're not going to. I mean, I thought they resolved all the threads that needed resolving. What do you think was unresolved that needed to be resolved? Well, just the whole 
I will say, when I say, I don't necessarily mind that it wasn't, that it was not all squished in together, but I can't help feeling, even though I loved the scene where it happened, the doctor giving custody of the fob watch to the TARDIS and saying, I'm not going to look at it. I'll save it for another day. Like, I'm not ready. Like, I'm not going to. Still felt like a bit of a cop out. Like, the way I would have lost my mind if the final shot was her opening the fob watch. You know what I mean? There's a way to do this that is like exciting. Um, <laughs> I don't think it would have been authentic though. It doesn't feel, I don't think based on the journey that the doctor went on, it doesn't make sense to me for the doctor to open the fog watch at the end of this episode. Mm. No, I see that. That doesn't seem like where the doctor was heading. Mm. I will say that last scene before Dan very rudely interrupted (laughs) between the doctor and Yaz. First of all, that was filmed like a romantic couple. That was a romantic disagreement being resolved with love and care and affection and communication and openness. And I adored it. And oh my God, Jodie Whittaker with that one tear, get out of here. <laughs> oh my God. Ah. But yeah, like, That was the high point for me. Everything else fell by the wayside a little bit. I adored Vinda and Di together. I thought they made a fantastic duo. But even, oh my God, like even the bloody Belle and Vinda storyline, right? And the fact that the baby had no real story or plot relevance or even really like emotional relevance like we have that cute little back and forth between Yaz and Binda sorry did I say Yaz and Binda Binda Bell and Binda I'm still holding out for that ship I love Bell but like Yaz and Binda had chemistry but I adore the way that his eyes kept on Bell after that moment but even then I'm feeling this emotional emptiness I completely disagree. I love the fact that Bell and Vinder were just two people romping about in space, like living their lives. I feel like that really, that really makes it a lot more, that really makes it a lot more meaningful for me, for them to be just two like regular, ordinary people who are like because I feel like one thing that Doctor Who is often missing is ordinary people who are extraordinary people like no one on Doctor Who is ordinary but people who are just living out their lives but aren't from Earth. I feel like this series of Flux by including Bell and Vinder really shows the expansiveness of the universe showing like oh there are people who live their lives and live expansive lives but they're just normal people they're people who live and fall in love and have babies and have have expansive love stories that span the galaxy and go to the academy together and get their honeymoon interrupted they're just people who live their lives and don't have anything particularly special about them but they're not from earth (laughs) Hmm. I feel like that's something that Doctor Who is often missing is that everyone is almost always like from Earth and there aren't any people who are just people like Doctor Who is always just picking up and having companions from like Earth and I feel like I think in classic Who that wasn't always the case but modern Who it's always just 
some young woman that the doctor picks up from the 21st century. And I really, really loved that that wasn't the case here and that they were just a normal couple who, and I really hope they come back because there was a lot of Easter eggs about things that went on with them. But yeah, I really loved their normalcy. I really loved that there wasn't some bigger picture mystery about them that just showed two people living their lives. And anyway, I'm just vibing. I feel like people are big mad, but I don't care. Um, I will say like what I'm not advocating for, like, I'm not a Bell and Vinda doctor parents truth of here. I'm not saying like that should, I'm saying that what I'm having issue with is that a pregnancy within a story is often a bit of a Chekhov's gun. Like you expect something to happen with it, whether that's the pregnancy goes wrong or the mother suddenly goes into labor or there's some kind of complication with the parentage or like whatever, like a pregnancy within a narrative is a plot device. And to not do anything with it felt really weird to me. That's all I'm saying. In regards to the Alien Companions thing, yes, absolutely. I would absolutely adore if we see in the next coming series more companions that are not from Earth. That was absolutely a pillar of the old who, and I would love to see that come back because I think it led to a much more interesting sort of story perspective that I think we could use now. I think that the pregnancy not being used as a plot device was fantastic. I think pregnancy is something that is just a natural part of life. And I loved the fact that nothing bad happened to Belle, nothing dramatic happened to Belle just because she was pregnant. I feel it's just having her be there and it not being a big deal except for the fact that it was there I thought that was really cool and I really liked it I didn't think it needed to be a big thing I just loved I loved seeing it and yes I know pregnancy is usually used as a plot device but it doesn't need to be it can just be someone can just be pregnant without it having to be a big deal people are pregnant all the time it doesn't have to be a plot device it can just be and that's what I really love is that it just it just is. Speaking of alien companions being important and being just part of the narrative, I adored the fact that Carvanista was the doctor's companion. That little moment between them where he was like, you were everything to me and you just swanned in acting like we were nothing and you didn't remember me. And that was heartbreaking. Also. I think also explains why he wanted to kill her so bad. (laughs) Because he was like, fuck you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Also, did you see how he paused after, like, he explains to Dr. I can't explain, first of all, yes, that little... Jody's reaction again, Jody masterclass, Jody goddess, like give, we're finally giving her material to work with. Delivery of like, were you my companion had me heartbroken, but the little pause after like Carvanista explains, like there's a device in my head. If I explain anything to you, I will be dead in three seconds. When the doctor like, in outrage, it's like the division did this to you. Carvanista does not answer her. He does not deny, he does not confirm. And I have a theory that maybe the doctor put it there. Yeah, I was also wondering, I was wondering whether he didn't confirm that it was the division because the division prevented him from confirming it or if that was like part of the thing that he couldn't say who did it or if it was that it wasn't the division it was someone else and I was like it's not the division who did it yeah also the Carvinista stuff is also part of why I felt like this episode did not have the stakes it needed 
I'm sorry, the genocide of his entire people should have been a bigger deal. Like that should have had weight. That should have had, that should have driven the story and definitely driven Carvinista's character from that point on. And we just don't get that weight. Like even the howl is pitiful. Like that should come from your gut. That should come from your belly. We should hear the pain of like, your entire loss there. And it felt like a dog that was upset that his dinner came late. Like, <laughs> I'm not feeling the anger. I mean, I felt that the pain and the loss was there. I felt it. I definitely felt that Carvanista was, I definitely felt that he was in, pain and shock over it I didn't think it was trivialized in any way or that it wasn't carried out or that it didn't have weight and any instances of him not having a full reaction I just chalked up to the fact that he was a division agent and he's compartmentalizing his emotions and he hasn't fully processed it yet because how how does one even fully conceptualize of the fact that their entire species is gone. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like also I should I should I should also put in a little sub clause. I'm not sure quite what the right terminology is. I'm aware the I'm aware the guy is in full prosthetics. Like it's hard to convey that much emotion when your face is entirely covered in fur. What I would actually love to see is if Carvinista, Bell and Vinda were like explored further like we follow them and their emotional journey maybe in a big finish or a comic series i think that could be super successful and very well received and i'd just love to dig into that more yeah i feel like there is so much potential for different big finish comic series definitely fan fiction between the adventures of Yaz, Dan, and Jericho in 1901 to 1905, because I'm sorry, they did not fit all of that traveling into 1904. Nick and Delia on Who Watch were right. They were definitely in 1905 by the end of, by the end of that little thing. I definitely want to see I, them uh, trying to like earn money in 1903 and 19 like I want to see them actually trying to live in the culture and failing miserably that's what I want (laughs) I'm I'm so curious about how they made money for all those steamboat trips because they were not cheap Uh, they were not cheap that was so expensive to do when you were traveling all over the world what were you doing why why was Yaz so good at disposing of bodies (laughs) my pet theory is that Jericho is like a professor and Dan is a history nerd. Yaz is just super smart. They were definitely betting on shit. They knew their history. Like they were like Dan. Dan is a football fan. Like he knew he like I'm betting. I'm betting that he was betting on games. (laughs) Like I'm betting he knows his sports history. I don't, I don't know if they had football in the early 1900s. I, I, I'm pretty sure they probably did have some kind of sports. But yeah, I'm betting Dan knows his sports history and they were betting on games real big. Like, I don't know. I feel like the doctor is probably very good at heist. So Yaz is very good at heist because the doctor never has money. The doctor never has money wherever they go. And so Yaz, I'm sure, is very good at talking her way into situations. I also wouldn't be surprised if the doctor had given Yaz her own psychic paper. That's also my pet theory is that Yaz has been traveling with the doctor long enough that the, like, the doctor was prepared enough to slip Yaz that little hologram. I wouldn't be surprised if like she was, she was, she was prepared for her and Yaz to be separated, right? I wouldn't be surprised if along with the hologram, she also slipped Yaz the psychic paper. Like she was, like she was, what? 
like a little travel kit, like a little keep yourself safe, hun, we'll see each other soon kind of business. Like she wouldn't just slip her the hologram and not slip her some other supplies. Like I bet she slipped her the hologram, some psychic paper. Mm -hmm. It's not like that. She had time to make a whole hologram. She had time to make a little travel kit with some psychic paper. Like if she had time to record that whole thing, she also had time to make a little kit. If she had time to record the whole thing, like to save it, like she had time. I always thought of the psychic paper as a unique item, but maybe they are, because it's pretty, it's pretty OP. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the psychic paper, it's a pad. Like it's a mm. pad with multiple sheets of paper on it. Oh yeah. That's that's you could rip some off, maybe. You could rip some off. And I would not be surprised if the doctor has more than one sheet of psychic paper. Because the thing is, other people know what psychic paper is. Yeah. Other people in the universe have encountered psychic paper and have trained against it. That's something that's established in the past. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if like psychic paper is something that is like produced and the doctor mm -hmm. has just stacks of it. Yeah. That might be fair. It might not be a unique item, but it might be a rare and powerful item. Also, I will say the doctor doesn't have any money, but like they have constant free travel and board, which is pretty good. <laughs> so a lot of the travel expenses are removed. Also in the old who it's established that the Tardis can make food. So they've also got that unlocked unless they want to explore the local delicacies even though we haven't really seen that in new Who. the other big finish that i really want is bell and vinder and carvanista but also i want just bell and vinder like their original adventures yes. um i want kate what she was up to because also the thing i don't know if you noticed it but kate says she's the leader of the human resistance so mm -hmm. Osgood is probably leading the Zygon resistance. And that's why I Osgood's not in the episode. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I saw someone on Twitter say anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I think there's a lot like, what I will say for this episode is that it leaves a lot of space, which I like. There's a lot of space for a lot of expansion of story. So we've got a lot of jumping off points for Big Finish, comics, fic, like whatever takes your fancy, which yeah. is a good, which is a point towards it. Yeah, it just, it did not have enough Kate Stewart. Like I said on Twitter, release the Kate cut. I want <laughs> Also, the Grand Serpent got what was coming to him, strand him on that rock. Like, I have a question. How long is he going to stay there though? Like, they did not strip him of anything. Like he's, I'm betting he still has a communicator. I'm betting he still has, like, how permanent is that exile? Also, 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 also. That's just leaving him to die of slow starvation. And also <laughs> the doctor is apparently super chill with, the, I, I get that they're mortal enemies or whatever, but like, especially considering that genocide is such like a hot button topic, the fact that the Cybermen and the Daleks and the Sontarans are like, well, guess I'm sacrificing them to the flux. Yeah, that, that was something I had a bit of a question about. My main thought was that, so I had, I had two thoughts. One was that the flux had to be stopped somehow. Might as well use all of these. Like the thing is, the Centaurans were about to destroy the Daleks and the Cybermen anyway. Like the Daleks and the Cybermen were about to be destroyed no matter what the doctor did. And if the doctor didn't do anything, then the Centaurans would be able to basically rule the universe. So first of all, the only group of people that the doctor is actually doing anything to is the Centaurans because it's the Centaurans who are killing the Daleks and the Cybermen. Second of all, what she's doing to the Centaurans is she's stopping them from taking over the universe, which yes, she's 
committing genocide on the Centaurians, which does not feel like a very doctor move. The way that I saw it was mostly that she was saying it's the universe of the Centaurians and she was picking the universe, which feels like feels like a very doctor thing to me, which is like the doctor's the person who's often having to make hard choices. And it's like the doctor's like, okay, I could let the whole universe be destroyed and let the Centaurans take over the universe or I could get rid of the Centaurans. Yeah. All I'm saying, it felt very, it, it all felt very for the greater good to me in a way that made me real uncomfortable and I don't know I feel like what bothers me about it is that we've had the doctor deal with the fact that they've had with the like idea of committing mass genocide before so much better like immediately and perhaps it's just because we've watched it so recently but like I'm immediately thinking of parting of the ways and like how deftly and beautifully it was done with Agnes and the Doctor and the weight it had again like I keep coming back to this idea of this episode lacked weight and I'm not asked I'm not asking for like grim dark I'm not asking for us to wallow in the grief and the like the like tragedy and the like oh my gosh the weight of the big decisions I'm just asking for it felt almost like gleeful or glib at points where it really really shouldn't have I feel like the tone was off for some really key elements and points that just left me feeling unsatisfied Yeah, I think, so a couple things. One is you have to consider that when the doctor was making these decisions too, she was split into three parts and wasn't like, didn't have her whole shit together. So I don't Mm. know that she was at like top form because she was also like, actively being tortured by swarm and azura at the same time so she was even so okay hold on let me let me finish so Mm -hmm. first of all i feel like she was not her normal self but second Mm -hmm. of all even if she was her normal self i feel like this doctor is a lot colder than people give her credit for like this doctor i feel like people often see this doctor with because she's all like smiles and rainbows on the surface they don't notice that like at her core this doctor is a lot more like they they often see this doctor is very like pacifist doesn't like looks for alternative solutions a lot of times but like when that veneer breaks through I feel like this doctor like when the switch is flipped is a lot colder and more calculating and more willing to go a lot farther while bottling up her reaction to the consequences than a lot of other doctors have been in the past. I'm thinking specifically of Kerblam, where there's, I know you haven't seen Kerblam yet, but there's a character who the doctor is like capable of saving. There's definitely a way in which this character doesn't have to die, but the doctor just straight up watches them die. Like just straight up lets them be killed. And it's like the coldest shit I've ever seen. <laughs> um, and it's, I feel like this doctor contains a sort of duality where it's sort of like on the surface, this doctor is a lot, a lot of sunshine and rainbows, but underneath this doctor is a lot colder and more calculating than, than some of the other doctors who like are outwardly like that. 
My problem with that is that we've seen that, right? That that's something we've seen with Eleven. And that's something that there was a lot of tenantisms in Jodie's acting this episode as well. Like I was seeing a lot of ten surfacing. And I think one of the issues that a criticism that I've seen of Jodie's doctor is that they don't seem to have quite found her unique space. What I find really frustrating is that I can't really think of things that make Jodie's doctor unique and Jodie's doctor like, a strong character to grasp to literally the only thing that's coming to mind right now and again I'm super aware I have not seen the vast majority of her run but like kind of the only thing that's coming to mind is the fact that she asks for consent but that's it so much of everything from her writing to her the way that she acts is drawn so directly from previous doctors that it's hard to see her and obviously the doctor is the same character throughout the whole thing but and I think this is not just a problem with Jodie I don't think this is just a problem with Chibnall but like kind of ever since Tennant the doctor's kind of been the same there was a lot more differentiation and different characterization in old who between doctors and I feel like that's part of what's been lost in the revival and it's really coming to fruition with Jodie like partially because she's not being written to as an actor I feel like like one of the things that I find frustrating and I understand this is a bit of a tangent but like Jodie's humor is quite slow. What Jodie excels in is not the quick jabs and gimmicks. She has a real talent in slow, quiet humour, but she's not given the space to use that. I feel like they're writing to a very specific version of the character rather than the actor that they hired to play the Doctor. And it's frustrating. I don't, I don't know that I agree. I definitely think that the 13th Doctor is distinct from the other Doctors. She feels very, very different to me. And it's not just that, like, she asks for consent where other Doctors don't. She, I well, one, I do think you're right that a lot of, since Tennant, the Doctors have been very similar. I think... 10 and 11 are the closest. They definitely feel very much like the same doctor. Capaldi is definitely a divergence. And then I think uh, Whitaker is an even further divergence. I think, also, I think it's really interesting when we talk about the doctors that we call them Eccleston, Tennant, Smith, Capaldi, and then Jody. Like we use for all the, for all the male doctors, we use their last names, but then for Jodie Whittaker's doctor, we use her first name. It's very interesting <laughs> that with the first female doctor, with the actor who plays her, we use her first name, where for all the male actors who play the doctor, we've used their last names. That's just something to note. But I think the, but anyway, the 13th doctor does feel very different to me. And all of the doctors, while similar, do feel like different people. They feel like different incarnations, like the way that they react to things, the situations that they're put in, the different, like the different adventures that they're put in. If you took the Centauran stratagem or vampires in Venice, or I don't know, like time heist, those are three episodes from different eras, like from different doctors. And you put 13th doctor in each of them. I can imagine the 13th doctor acting very differently in each of those episodes. And I can imagine the 13th Doctor approaching them very differently and how they would all, I can imagine, like I can imagine each episode going very differently. And I can imagine the Doctor going about about it in a different way. And so if you take like a past Doctor's episode and a past Doctor's adventure and put a new Doctor into it, 
I can imagine how that different doctor would go about it in a different way and just be a completely different person in that story. And I guess that's, I guess that's one example of how I think that they're distinct and would treat them differently. And I think how they would interact differently. And by the way, listeners, that was a thick prompt. We want them on our desks by (laughs) next week. I actually, I actually might think about writing a writing a fic where a different honestly I'd love to read it I'd love to see it because at the moment I'm not convinced and first of all I 100% agree with you I think it's very very interesting that collectively we tend to refer to the 13th doctor as Jodie's doctor and I definitely want to watch myself going forward and refer to her as Whitaker yeah I just I guess it's something to look for in the future. I'm really, really sad that that we only seem to be really getting in the stride of giving material that is worthy of her and that she can really bite into just as she's leaving. That's another issue that I've had with this sort of giving the 13th Doctor this puppy dogs and roses outlook is that Jody has such strength in deep drama and she's not given a lot of space to do that work consistently and I don't know I also think it's really unfortunate that this is going to be so many people's favorite season because Chris Chibnall did such such important work in bringing in a more diverse group of writers and this is going and this is the only season where he wrote almost all the episodes although I will note pay attention to the fact that the episode that was according to like almost all the polls that I've seen again on Twitter the episode in like just the general popular opinion that I've seen like listening to podcasts and stuff one of the episodes that people love the most is Village of the Angels which is one that was co-written with Maxine Alderton Maxine Alderton for showrunner please 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 um, RTD you've had your time two of the episodes that people adored in seasons 11 and 12 were Demons of the Punjab and The Fugitive of the Jadoon, which were Vinay Patel. Rosa was Mallory Blackman. Haunting of Village Yodati was, again, Maxine Alderton. So, like, bringing in a diverse set of writers, like, actually works. There are studies on this or something. It's almost like it's scientifically proven that diversity always makes things better. <laughs> also, like, RTD, just, like, bring bring back some of these writers because they're so great. I just want to get your opinion. What do you reckon about that little hint, that little smidgen of hope for some master action in the specials? I'm so ready. I'm so ready. (laughs) Uh, I'm so ready. I'm so ready. I'm going to Galley and Sasha Dwan is going to be there. And I'm just fingers crossed that I get to like actually meet him and have a real proper conversation, not just on a panel. <sighs> I'm really hopeful I'll be able to give him a Whitley Wobbly sticker. By the way, yes, we have stickers now. I'm, I'm going to be a Galley. I'm going to be handing out stickers. I'll give They're you actually. They're really cool. They're really, I just, Talia was lovely and sent me also a whole bunch of them. I have them now, they're delightful. I will be sticking them in many inappropriate places. (laughs) I'm excited. Come find me a galley, I'll give you a free sticker until they run out. But I have like about a hundred of them. So get them while they last. I unfortunately will not be at Galley because this world is a hellhole and I, I, I'm, I, I'm not doing that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm not visiting any conventions across the ocean. Well, the is, does. <laughs> the borders to Australia are like super tight. Oh my God. Like 
getting getting your getting getting your package past customs took two weeks <laughs> you'd think with how tight and restrictive they are they'd be more efficient but no <laughs> Yeah, no, but I will be a galley. Just come find me. Say hi from a decent distance. We'll come close enough for me to give you a sticker and then we'll back away. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you what do you think of this episode? I want to give it a fabulous, but I have a feeling that you don't. Yeah, no, it's it's a firm low funky for me. I'm sorry. It just it did not deliver in the way that I hoped it would. And I'm really sad actually. There were some like there were definitely high points. There were definitely things that I really super enjoyed. We didn't even get to touch on once again, Azure and Swarm get the short end of the stick and we will not be discussing them. Uh, but their whole scenes were very fascinating. I adored Azure's comments on like faith and religion, very up my alley. And of course, all of the gay shit was delightful. But yeah, no, it's a firm low funky for me. Well, I mean, we'll get the chance to discuss them next week because spoiler alert, we're gonna have a seventh flux episode Next week, we're going to be talking about the series as a whole in a bonus episode, not a mini episode. Although this episode has been so long, it's not really a mini episode. Two weeks in a row. Woo! (laughs) Anyway, so yeah, we'll hopefully get to discuss the Ravagers next episode. And then the week after that, we start season two with the Christmas Invasion. Y'all are not ready for our opinions on Christmas Invasion. I'm just saying, I'm just saying the, I'm just saying the raw recording is two and a half hours long (laughs) (laughs) yeah we're we're gonna shorten it we're gonna shorten it we're gonna do our best (laughs) best, but just just so you know y'all are not ready we have many opinions (laughs) so many opinions yeah and then season two will have will be interrupted with a little mini bonus episode when we talk about Eve of the Daleks but yeah so yeah also just a reminder our season two episodes were recorded like months ago so we're not many many months ago many many months ago I think back in like June um, so we're not going to be referencing flux at all they are deep in the past season two has a bunch of fun guests not every episode but um, we're going to be talking to some fun guests featuring some people who are hosts of other podcasts that you may have heard of anyway yeah so thank you for joining us on this mad flux adventure. We'll see you next week. See you soon. Toodaloo. Thank you for listening to the Wibbly Wobbly Timey Wimey podcast. We hope you enjoyed this adventure with us through space and time. You can find us elsewhere on the internet on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram at WibblyPod. Follow us for more Wibbly Wobbly content. You can find out more information about us and our content on wibblywobblytimeywimey.net and full transcripts for episodes at wibblywobblytimeywimey.net slash transcripts. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at wibblywobblytimeywimeypod at gmail.com. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and other platforms as it helps other people find us and our content. That's all for now. Catch you in the time vortex. <laughs>